You might be wondering why we're not peering through a microscope just yet. Well, that's because we first need to find the samples we want to inspect today. Most of us consider ticks a pest, including me, but at least for microscopic purposes they are extremely fascinating. We usually encounter them during the blood meal, firmly attached to our bodies. While it's tempting to inspect them under the microscope after removal, most of the times we damage the tick and at least lose the hypostome, that tiny stinger of theirs. So we are flipping the script today. We are not running from ticks, we are catching them. This right here is my personal tick hunting hotspot on the first sunny days of March and with the rising temperatures the ticks should already be highly active. Take a look around, sparse vegetation and everything is covered in leaves. Ticks seem to love such a place and I was successful hunting them here a couple of years back. You will be surprised by the simplicity of our hunting toolkit. So first of all I brought a macro objective for my camera to show you the ticks up close. And as for our top-notch high-tech hunting apparatus, it's the trusty old white bedsheet. Apart from that, we will need some tweezers and 70% alcohol to collect them. To make sure we are not the ones on the menu, I'm pulling my socks over the trousers and generously applying some insect repellent. I do realize that I might not win a fashion competition, but it's the most stylish choice when you want to avoid health hazards from tick bites. So let the hunt begin, which is actually as simple as slowly dragging the bed sheet across the forest floor. I didn't cut the footage here on purpose, just so you can see that after dragging it for only a few meters, we already caught our first sample. After flipping the bed sheet, I checked for tiny moving creatures, and there it was, our first juvenile tick with two more just out of sight. I'm now going to pick up the tick with the tweezers, which can be a bit annoying because of the small size. And we directly put the tick into the alcohol, which usually leads to the tick just letting go and it immediately sinks to the bottom. Even when submerged in alcohol, they don't give up easily and can hold their own for several minutes. I kept collecting for another half an hour and was amazed by the number of ticks I got, despite just collecting in this small area. I mostly caught juvenile ticks, but there were also some adult individuals, both male and female here and there. Here we can see the incredible size gap between a young tick and a full grown male. How do I know it's a male tick, you might ask? It's all about the scutum the shield-like armor on their dorsal side. It's an easy gender identifier. Males got it all covered, the entire back. Meanwhile, the females prefer a more modest approach with the scutum extending only part way down their bodies. And the scutum is the reason male ticks are less frequently responsible for disease transmission than females. They're stuck with small blood meals because their shell won't budge an inch. The females, however, stay attached, feed for a long time, which also allows to transmit diseases. In just half an hour we've managed to round up over 40 ticks. If you're wondering why I went all out with the insect repellent, this is the reason why. Now let's jump back into the lab to turn these ticks into permanent slides. This is what we are gonna need. Starting from the left we have the ticks we collected previously, then a tube for chemical waste, we then have a flask filled with lactic acid to bleach the tick, my mounting medium Uperol, isopropyl alcohol, the stock solution of lactic acid, toothpicks, slides and cover glasses, some tweezers and a small brush. We'll start with pouring off a small amount of 80% lactic acid into the small bottle. The ticks will be submerged in lactic acid for at least 24 hours to bleach them. Ticks contain a lot of chitin, making them relatively opaque for bright field observation. The lactic acid gently bleaches the chitin, making the tick more translucent. Just check after 24 hours and extend the time if needed. Once the tick has been sufficiently bleached, it is time to dehydrate it using 100% isopropyl alcohol. This step is necessary as the mounting medium Uperol does not tolerate water. 
The ticks are transferred into the isopropyl alcohol and remain there for at least 5 minutes. This process is repeated two more times by removing the used alcohol and replacing it with fresh one. This ensures that the tick is free of any water. Now it's time to make the permanent slides. As already mentioned, I will use Upro as the mounting medium which preserves the tick for years and is a very common mounting medium for microscopists. Using a toothpick I drip some mounting medium onto the slide. This is simply the most convenient way for me as I can discard the toothpick later on. I next pick up the tick from its alcohol bath using a fine brush and remove any excess isopropanol on a paper towel. Uperol is soluble in isopropanol, but there is really no need to further dilute it. Now we place the cover glass on top using special cover glass forceps, which allow me to place it at a shallow angle onto the mounting medium to avoid air bubbles. This step is the most finicky one, as even the juvenile ticks tend to be rather thick, making it necessary to use more mounting medium and sometimes to use underlaying supports to avoid tilting cover glasses. Possible supports are simply chipped cover glass pieces placed underneath every corner of the actual cover glass that then sits on top of the tick. Some weights are then added onto the cover glass to create an even slide. And here we can see the final result of one of the slides I made after drying it for several days. Now we can take a look at this tick in Brightfield using a 10x objective. We are looking at a juvenile tick from the genus Ixodes, and I'm currently focusing on the hypostome, which is the barbed mouth part that anchors the tick to its host. Flanking the hypostome on both sides are the so-called palps. These sensory mouth parts fold back during the blood meal. Now looking at its legs, we can see that there are also some hooks on each end to attach to a passing by host. However, a truly remarkable feature resides on their front legs, the Huller's organ. This specialized sensory organ plays a pivotal role in the tick's quest for both hosts and mates, sensing humidity, pheromones, carbon dioxide and temperature. In essence, it functions similar to the antennas of insects, housing chemosensitive cells within its cavity. Astonishingly, this organ even employs infrared detection to perceive the radiant warmth emitted by potential hosts. As we've already observed in the previous shot, we've transitioned to using differential interference contrast microscopy, and we've now switched to a 20x objective lens. Once again, our focus is on the hypostome, but I'm eager to introduce you to another feature situated just below it, the chelicera. These structures become apparent as we fine-tune our focus and they play a pivotal role in the tick's ability to penetrate our skin. Unlike the relatively immobile hypostome, the chelicera are movable. They employ their sharp edge to cut through the skin, facilitating the tick's digging process. Looking at the rest of the tick, we immediately notice the furrowed and hairy surface of the body. What is extremely cool is that we can even see the muscle fibers inside the tick's legs. At the bottom we have the anus, which is located inside an anal groove, and this can be an important feature to differentiate different tick species. Lastly we have the spiracle on the left and right side of the body, which is the opening to the tracheal system and allows the tick to breathe. That wraps up what I wanted to showcase today. I hope this has inspired you to venture out and snag some interesting samples of your own using your trusty old bedsheet.